have seen uh, some banks move uh, to decouple the issue of consequential losses uh, from technical redress, which is a point that um, I will return to uh, later in my speech. The, uh, my hon. Friend, the member for Wolverhampton South East, uh, reminded the House that uh, this scandal has further corroded and damaged trust between banks and their customers, and he drew a parallel with the, uh, previous scandals, including uh, the PPI scandal, which certainly should concentrate uh, minds. He also reminded us that hedging and insuring against risks is not in and of itself wrong, and he's certainly right about that, uh, but there has to be full understanding um, as to what these arrangements involve, uh, and we must make sure that where they are entered into, they are done so in a way that is suitable uh, for both the companies uh, that are getting involved in the banks too. Um, the, my hon. Friend, the member for Lenethley, uh, uh, told us about the tragedy of good and very successful businesses who have been caught up uh, in this scandal and the real fear felt by small businesses in seeking redress and how that can act as a barrier for them using, uh, fulfilling their full rights under the redress scheme uh, because of the fear of admitting that something has gone wrong and what that might mean for their future relationship uh, with their bank. And I thought that that was an important point to be put um, on the record. Uh, my honourable friend, the member for Edinburgh South, um, reminded us again of the uh, link between uh, this scandal and the corrosion uh, of trust uh, that people feel towards the banks, uh, and how that's followed on from the PPI scandal and the manipulation of LIBOR, um, and how this all feeds into a sense that uh, the banks, who are supposed to be on the side of small businesses, and clearly they need them as much as small businesses need the banks, uh, have not been appearing to behave in that way, and that that's, this is something that needs to be dealt with forthwith. Uh, Honourable members opposite, including the member for Poole, uh, for Bury North, uh, for South West Devon, uh, for Romsey and Southampton North, all made uh, points about uh, the snail's pace uh, of this scheme, which is a point I shall return to uh, in a moment. Uh, but those points were very well made, uh, and I hope that they are being heard. And finally, the member for Tiverton and Honiton. I think I won't get into whether uh, David Felling Goliath is mythological or biblical or something else. Uh, but I think that the analogy and the symbolism of that uh, was w well made and uh, will resonate um, outside of this House. Um, I think it's clear, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, from the contributions that have been made today uh, that the businesses that have been caught up in this scandal, including businesses in my own constituency following this debate very closely from a place not very far away, um, have suffered uh, very terribly. Uh, we have heard distressing stories today of injustice, of bankruptcies, job losses, marriage breakdown, homelessness and, in some cases, death. Um, and in hearing members' contributions today, the House is rightly reminded that for all the debate about process, which is incredibly important and we have to make sure that we get it right, there is a human cost here which should not be forgotten. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The scandal has highlighted shocking abuse of uh, small and medium-sized businesses. Banks saw an opportunity in firms wanting to take out loans, and they attached complex hedging products to them, in many cases giving the impression that this was a requirement of the loan itself. And when interest rates plummeted, businesses were forced to pick up the punitive downside of these hedges. We know that in many cases the banks had the option to cancel the loan, so presumably at any stage when interest rates might have gone up and the business would have benefited benefited from having the hedge, the bank could cancel, but in the reverse situation, the business could not exit the hedge when it became unfavourable to them without incurring punitive costs and charges. Madam Deputy Speaker, apart from being an, an, an extremely unfair set of terms and conditions, uh, this behaviour has violated the important relationship of trust between the banks and our small business community, and well-run, long-established small businesses that are the engine of our economy have paid the price. I won't rehearse the history of how we got to uh, the redress process that is currently in place, but suffice to say, and I hope the Minister has heard all of these points today, there are many concerns um, with this scheme which require urgent action. I hope that uh, not only he will uh, take those points away with him, but that the FCA and the banks have been listening very carefully to the debate today also. The biggest issue, in my view, is um, we've heard a great deal about this today, is the time that all of this is taking uh, to resolve. And time is, of course, of the essence for the businesses concerned, and yet we know that figures show that banks paid out just £1.5 million in compensation in September, with 22 offers being accepted, which brings us to a grand total of a mere £2 million being paid out and 32 settled claims. In September, the Chairman of the Federation of Small Businesses said, and I quote, we are quickly losing confidence in the banks and the regulator as this scheme remains unbelievably slow. Madam Deputy Speaker, the initial target indicated for the redress 
redress scheme was six months, a timescale which has already been missed and now looks as if it will be missed by a very large margin. And one of the biggest issues uh, with the redress scheme is the complete lack of a deadline uh, to the process. Last month, my colleagues, the Honourable Member for Nottingham East and the Honourable Member for Chesterfield, wrote to the Chief Executive of the F FCA over the delay in compensation payments and requested a strict deadline for settlement to be imposed on those banks who are taking part in the scheme. Unfortunately, the imposition of a deadline has been resisted by the FCA, which is deeply disappointing given the necessity of achieving a faster rate of progress for businesses that are in financial difficulty and the fact that the FSB have indicated that some reviews of the interest rate swap products that are the subject of the review could be completed in as little as four or to six weeks. I am sure the Minister will agree that firms which are due redress must receive it as quickly as possible if they are to survive. They need certainty and they need some clarity so they can plan for the future. So does he agree, and I hope he will respond to this when he uh, is on his feet, uh, that a deadline would help matters and will he outline for us uh, what he might do to bring that about? Um, on the issue of consequential losses, um, we have seen some movement on this issue in the last 48 hours, which is very welcome, uh, but it is important that uh, we quickly see all the other banks that have not signed up uh, to this decoupling arrangement between consequential loss and technical redress sign up to it as quickly as possible. And because this is now an evolving element of the redress scheme, I wonder if uh, the Minister could indicate that he will follow this very closely uh, to ensure that the process that is, as I say, now evolving somewhat uh, will still allow for a fair assessment of consequential losses and that there is no risk that businesses uh, will opt to forgo money that they are um, owed in order to obtain compensation for direct losses more quickly. Uh, we also heard a lot on the uh, suspension of payments, um, and this is an issue where con um, lots of members of this House have been writing to banks uh, in our capacity as constituency members of Parliament. It is very clear that um, there is uh, uh, some uh, inconsistency in the way in which suspension of payments is being applied.